Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is Thursday afternoon, folks. Uh, just afternoon, as a matter of fact. Ted Ralston here in our studio downtown Honolulu, momentarily transposed to Waimanalo Bay. Uh, for our show, Where the Drone Leads, bringing to our public and to others uh, uh, information about this emerging role and capability and technology that we all call drones or unmanned systems. Um, we're all kind of getting back together after the several recent uh, hurricanes here, and we uh, thank very much uh, George Purdy from the State Fire Department at the Lanai Airport on Lanai for joining us. Once again, George, uh, thanks for coming on board. And how are things looking on Lanai after a couple of days of pasting by, uh, by, the, by Olivia? Oh, it's a beautiful day here on Lanai. <laughs> nice blue skies and well prepared. OK, so the island's prepared. And, and, and we actually got kind of a light touch from uh, Miss Olivia as she went by. She certainly uh, didn't do quite what we expected on Oahu, so that was all good for all of us. But uh, we're expecting on the program uh, Charles Warner of the National Council of Unmanned Air Systems or Drones in Public Safety. But uh, Charles on the East Coast in Virginia is out assisting with Hurricane Florence right now, so uh, he won't be joining us on the show. And uh, also, uh, uh, John Johnson will get him on in, in probably four weeks. Uh, John is uh, one of our uh, top creative artists using drones. And what I really wanted to do, George, was with you and John, was fuse together the thinking between public safety use of drones, uh, disaster response use of drones, which tend to be not artistic or, or, or expressive in a way, and, and just see how working with the, the expressive side of the house, such as what John Johnson is at the top of that profession, how that might influence each other, inform each other, or improve the total operation. Certainly telling a story is an important factor, whether it's in uh, uh, commercial art or in uh, disaster operations. But you know, short of that, uh, again, with the situation we have now, what we want to do today is focus on something that came out of our conversation a couple of weeks ago when you were on the show. We had the FAA on, we had uh, uh, commercial helicopters, Eric Lincoln on, and we were talking about sharing the airspace and how we're all going to work this through the FAA standards with the other users of the airspace. But, but beyond that, we have you introduced to us something that was quite unique. And that was to what you've done on Lanai with the fire department, is use the authorizations and authority you have presently provided to you through the state fire department design. And if you've used that without changing it, but you've brought UAS into it in a controlled and responsible fashion. And it will, let's talk a little bit more about that because I believe that's the essence of a talk you have to give in Alaska in two weeks. And I think it's also something that uh, Charles Warner uh, would look very much uh, look upon to receive as for him to use as he's thinking about this situation in the National Council for Unmanned Air Systems and Public Safety. So tell us in a little more detail, George, how you got that idea, how you started, and where it's going uh, as, it, as practiced today on the island of Lanai. Well, for me, I was just looking at all our airport procedures and how do we um, look at our outside resources that come help when we have a plane crash. So I took all those elements and looked at our MOUs on how we interact and work with each other. So I looked at the point from taking some wildland firefighting uh, fundamentals, some of our aircraft rescue fundamentals, and then looking at what the FAA has to offer. And basically with all our foundations, there was a line that was drawn of how we actually work together. So I looked at it, thought about it, and then just the wording in general, I talked to my fixed base operator here at Lanai Airport and asked them, could you put in a notum for me? And he said, yes, I could. So when we put it in, we wrote it that we, the fire department, are asking for the UAS airspace from the airport center point four miles out. That'll encompass our town, the electric infrastructure, uh, harbor infrastructure, and highways. So our airport fits within five miles, encompasses the whole island, all the infrastructures that was needed. So when I showed up to the incident, uh, or the emergency operations center, I had this task that this airport now 
that we can help provide the community and other first responders the communication and organization of all our local uh, Part 107 operators and hobbyists. I created two levels, one and two. That way, I, I, it's basically in the sense that I open up my house, I open my door, and I'm inviting you in. It's not where you're going to come into my house and barge in. So through invitation, RSVP, you come, we inspect you, we get to know you, we check your equipment, we go through the whole protocols of flying. And then I ask the operators, in a sense, what is their experience? And if they're not the experience type, I could also use them in helping me within my, say, office in paperwork, getting them involved, getting them to understand the overall picture on how we as emergency resources, resource management, manage the whole situation and educate them from within. So you took a plan that existed, which was the Lanai Airport plan that deals with the community around it within that four or five mile radius. And that plan pre-existed, pre-existed UAS, pre-existed uh, a lot of things, but it caused and it defined a means of interaction between the various agencies that are responsible. And so you took the implied responsibility in that interaction and you found that that justified and authorized to a certain extent uh, the additional technology brought forward by UAS. So you're not causing anybody to change any protocols. You're simply writing on the protocols that exist and bringing this new technology in in a controlled way with a, uh, a managed way and a graduated functionality way. The more capable people are, the higher level they can perform in that group. If they're not at that level of experience, they step back and operate at a lower level. But you've added this in a structured way, UAS operations to an existing protocol and didn't have to generate any new protocols to make this all happen. That's what I'm hearing you say. Is that uh, a fair summary? That's a, that's a fair summary. It, it's all there. It, it, at times, you know, sometimes we, a lot of um, higher management overthinks it. And just because the public screams wolf, we should not take that as that is the end of all, end of all things. We should look at what's in our uh, basic response plans and the, use that as our foundation and figure out how the community works. And what helps is that we come from the same community. And the thing is, every location we have members that live in these communities that can go home and educate their communities. So you're actually using this thing two ways. You're using it uh, to uh, provide a means and a method by which new technologies such as UAS can come into the picture. You're also using it as a reverse flow to get information out to the community about how the coordinated joint operating system works in disaster response. That's exactly right. Oh, uh, we may have lost George's picture here. There we go. We got you back. I'm back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you could actually think of this as a, a model for additional technology to be added. For example, underwater uh, unmanned systems. We saw one uh, that uh, Michael Motus and uh, Kainoa Jimenez from uh, Colea Gold were demonstrating to the Coast Guard last week. These are now available. You know, for a couple thousand bucks, you can get a 100-foot uh, tether underwater robotic system. For, so for the harbor and uh, seacoast areas, inspecting issues like uh, pilings of uh, bridges or, or piers, uh, anything underwater that might have, uh, be a, has, uh, a hazmat situation or something, some issue going on, uh, that's available as well. So you could even think of bringing the underwater folks in to the game uh, at some point in time in the future, following all the, I wouldn't call them protocols, but all the understandings you generated that sit on top of that one pre-existing protocol. Yeah, I mean, all our departments, we only can do so much. So when we hit these big natural disasters, anything that exceeds our normal capabilities, our normal resources, that's when these protocols and these links to all these agencies actually come into play. So, for example, our hurricane season, that means that everybody's coming to the table. What are you bringing? How can we help each other? And how can we use these new technologies in a manageable way? So, basically, what I created is that we as airports for this community, which I understand and I know my community, and because I'm in the UAS game, I can actually bring them in, invite them in, 
and educate them and actually put them to work in a safe environment. And that's key. As long as they're safe, responders are safe, nobody's going to say no. That's, that's a, uh, the fact that you're on Lanai, which is a 3,100 population, a single airport, and everybody pretty much knows each everybody else. You're related to quite a few people, George, in this island uh, group. Uh, for example, it's a, it's a great place where the, 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 the pre-existing knowledge base exists and the trust and the confidence exists and you can create something like you've, like you've done. How do you see taking what you've done here and translating that over to Maui, for example, or to Oahu or to uh, Charles Warner's area in, um, in Virginia? Well, this is where we got the media and that artistic person with the drones where we create positive um, articles of what we're doing and sharing it with these communities where it's coming from the community, accepting and volunteering and coming to the call of emergency management on a large scale. And then over time, once on a large scale that we get this accomplished, you can break down these components and then you can install them into your local fire department, local police department, local DNR. But when the time need, in need, when we are in need, we can actually come together and all everybody brings a piece of the puzzle and we have just a massive uh, data collection of organizations with all types of technology. Well, I think we, it, uh, we sort of have an obligation to bring this up and look at it from all kinds of perspectives when Charles is back uh, from uh, chasing Hurricane Florence because I think this is an important element that might be overlooked in, as, as you say, as people tend to think too big on things. I, I often fall into that trap that you mentioned of overthinking the situation and we maybe need to underthink it a little bit and, and start with what is already there and uh, make sure we capitalize on everything we can without having to invent anything new and that's exactly uh, the policy you've created. So I think we collectively have the obligation to put that into a, a, a discussion that can occur up in Alaska in a couple of weeks and then uh, get that over to Charles uh, as well in Virginia, see what he thinks, and how that can became, become part of the emerging general strategy here. And what, what's intriguing is, to me anyway, is that uh, there are standards starting to form up everywhere. There's technical standards forming up in the structure and the materials and propulsion. There are ASTM F38 takes care of that. There are communication and software standards beginning to show up coming out of RTCA. Uh, we'll hear more about that as, as they come closer. And some of those organizations that are setting up standards really need to know the operational side of the house as well as the technical side of the house in order to make those standards uh, as useful as they can be in supporting what you're doing. So uh, we need to somehow uh, get you and, and Charles in front of these other standards organizations and make sure that as the standards are developed, they continue, continue to fit the operational, uh, operational framework of reality. And uh, let's talk yeah, about, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, so one of my um, ideas is why I came up with the protocol was I needed to be able to teach a brand new, fresh recruit firefighter with no experience behind him how to get him to understand it in the most simplest form. Because if you look at our fire departments today, we have many recruit classes. A lot of us who are veterans, we're leaving. So we need to be able to pass that information on. And when I'm now part of that community as a retired person, I want to make sure my fire department is running the way I left it and doing better. Let's talk about that, the broader educational context of this after we get back from our one minute break. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff, but I really like energy stuff, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're gonna talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're gonna definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha. I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 and I have really, really exciting guests 
on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. It is still the noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu studio, uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, George Purdy joining us from the uh, airport fire department on Lanai. And uh, George is, uh, is absolutely one of our leaders in the state and, and certainly in the nation in thinking through how to take complex new technology and add it to the existing protocols of public safety joint operations. That's a mouthful. But uh, I, I do want to also uh, thank George for all the uh, thought leadership he's provided to me. I've enjoyed that very much. We were talking uh, just before the break about uh, the means by which new recruits coming into your fire department or anybody's department, whatever it might be, how we need to leave something behind that they can grasp onto without having to have them reinvent the future. How do we take what we've done collectively or singly and convert that into a policy or a methodology that then can serve those coming behind? And uh, both you and I, my, myself, way beyond you, George, are Notice my hair is getting kind of white and uh, won't be doing this forever. So uh, it's up to us to leave something behind that attracts that kind of new idea, uh, but sets a stage for how it can be incorporated safely and effectively. So I think we have both on the, on the department level or the agency level, we also have a joint obligation to work with the schools and the educational system. So uh, once again, with the leadership that you are able to profess and perform on Lanai, how do you see that, George, in both the, the department you work in, and then how do we broaden that to bring it into the schools in general? Well, I'm looking at um, bringing it into the schools after this hurricane season, especially um, our graduating seniors, juniors, and sophomores, and we have um, a day of uh, what we call job day, where we actually go to our schools and we're in uniform, we bring all our equipment, and we sit at a booth and we educate the students that, you know, who would want to be a fireman one day, who wants to live on this island. And then we show them the new technologies, we explain what we do and how do we serve and uh, help our communities, and we look at disasters across the world and we just want to help people. Okay, and so that's certainly the top level picture. In, in terms of the specific uh, aspect of drones and UAS, if you think about that from a, from a high school student perspective and combining that with the need to serve the public that you have over in the fire department, uh, some form of connective curriculum would need to be constructed that can rely on the existing do doctrine you've put in place, but also allow the more free-thinking kids to start thinking about how they might make that better. What if we had a, like a competition of some kind, help the fire department, just to coin a, coin a phrase. How, uh, would that work? Having a, a, a way to uh, induce the kids to think about how they might assist bringing these kind of technologies forward? And that doesn't include just UAVs, underwater vehicles as well. Also, you know, social media. What if we sort of had that? How we would, uh, uh, how do we encourage the kids to think out of the box? as you think out of the box, as you and I exit stage right? Well, I would say, like, for me as a fire department, I would take my island and my fire department, uh, go into the schools, and I'll be their adoptive depart uh, department, giving them the scenarios, and together we'll work together on accomplishing our scenario, write a, a paper on it, we do videos, and then maybe we could submit it and we have every island a fire department. For so like me, I'm a parent. There's many other firemen friends that I know are, are parents that their kids are in school. We could do an island-wide competition, submit videos, written um, documentation of what we've done and how we accomplished it, and go from there. And then maybe put up a trophy with Think Tech on TV. Maybe we sending in videos and put a small show together and do something. That we could something do. we can do like the Lego, Lego League, um, Robotics, that framework works. So because you actually have the, the in, in, um. Go ahead. Well, I just say we're uh, suffering from the, uh, the 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 two or three second time delay here on our comms, but uh, 
Uh, that's, a, that's a interesting idea. Now, robotics and uh, the various competitions that exist generally are against a, a uh, somewhat fictitious challenge such as uh, robot wars or something like that and they're set in a, in a conference room or set in a gymnasium environment. If we took that as a base and thought of an outdoor environment, a real issue, wildfire for example, uh, search and rescue in the ocean, the things that really matter, the things where budget is being spent, the things where people are at risk and are being addressed because of that, uh, and have a, a competition, you know, once again at, at, the, at the high school level, just thinking about this out loud here, first time we've ever had this conversation, George, but a, yep. a means by which that group of people can think through how they would solve that problem based on what we've created already, which may not be the best, in, in their mind. Uh, I, I just wonder who we would get to sponsor that and uh, uh, what, what the next, next step would be after somebody wins it. What do we do? Do we actually implement? Uh, but that's something that um, maybe a, a national organization like, like AUVSI would be interested in. I know AUVSI sponsors uh, RoboX out here in, on Oahu which will be in Kehi Lagoon again this year, which is uh, kind of a high level, graduate level. But we need to make these connections with the, with the, with the formal agencies starting in the high school level, at, at the high school level. Well, I totally agree. This actually creates a two-way street. It creates us, the first responders, getting information to our future first responders and these kids in school actually go back home and start talking story with their parents. And it, with this competition, just like how my son's in football right now, they want to come out and see. So now you start bringing in everybody around the students and this technology and just a simple form of a threat that they figure it out how to accomplish it with using these tools. So key thing to any emergency out here is we always try to get that information, like how on this storm, there's not enough information going around or there's a lot of information going around. These are the things that what I've just seen in the last 48 hours that this little program that we're talking about could take off. Yeah, you, you know, there's a, the more we talk about this, the more sense it makes. I mean, we've had an interaction with uh, Kaliloa Intermediate School and the airport in uh, the John Rogers Airport on uh, West Oahu. You've had so much interaction on Lanai Airport. Um, we could even bring the FAA into this picture because certainly whatever we do is gonna to have to conform to FAA standard and emerging uh, management functions for UAS. But uh, it would be unfair to ask you to start this on Lanai, but it's also fair to ask you that because you do it so well and because you have everything set already there. But, uh, Nevertheless, we, we, I think we have a phone call next week with the Aerospace States Association, which uh, Hawaii is part of. We have the AOPA, we have AUVSI. Somewhere in, and we have Charles Warner and the uh, National Council for uh, UAS Ops and Public Safety. Four organizations that I think all would, would be really interested in this high school level uh, competition. How do we, again, quoting, how do we take this kind of technology and bring it into the, in this case, the fire service? Um, with uh, local knowledge and local application being the measure of success. Uh, I, I will I absolutely bring this up with our, our friends in AOPA who've been on the show and, and uh, Aerospace State Association. Maybe we can put together a two or three paragraph proposal, even toss it out in, in Alaska in a couple of weeks and uh, see if we can get this, get this started because it's, the, it's those kids who are gonna be inheriting the fire department, they're gonna be inheriting the fires, they're gonna be inheriting the island, and uh, why not have them have this stake in ownership uh, right now, and once again, so that we can make sure the standards as they emerge in unmanned air systems conform, meet and support that kind of necessary civil responsibility. Exactly, and I think it'll help the healing between government and community. And the community won't feel like we're infringing on their privacy flying over them. Because we have that interaction, we're doing something positive, and you're teaching that next generation not to be that person that's out there doing bad things. So you're already refocusing them to do something good. That is a, a very 
a compelling reason just in itself. Actually, it also, uh, the standards have an influence on the way manufacturers perform it as well. So we would be able to get actual, uh, in this case, firefighting needs baked into the, requir the design requirements, let alone the certification and operating requirements. So George, uh, we're going to have some time together in a couple of weeks, same place, in where it's cold. And by the way, uh, yep. when you step off the airplane in Fairbanks, uh, it, it's okay to have Zori on during the flight, but probably need shoes and socks on the other end because it's going to be cold up there, George. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm prepared this time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, surf shorts uh, probably won't work in the 40 degree climate either. So uh, be just uh, caution on that one. Anyway, uh, so I like this idea. And uh, I like the idea of us getting together, sketching something out, see what the people, the organizations that are uh, kind of above us, uh, would, how they would respond to this, but make this an annual event, a competition, once again, as we're saying it here, a competition, uh, and a, very much an applied robotics competition, I would say, is what it is. It isn't just a competition, robotics. That's it. It's applied. It's applied and has a real world effect. Yeah, it's applied and you measure it in the real world effect, the value at, measured at the real world. And with actual real world people such as fire department members providing comment and feedback on the, what's, been, what's been designed and developed and proposed. It's sort of like a science fair. It's an applied science fair dealing with real issues that are emerging. And in fact, that could actually be the means by which we deal with these emergent big picture changes like climate change, like global warming. I mean, all the hurricanes we've had here in Hawaii in the last couple of years, it, we never had any of those when it was kids. Makani What's that? Makani Pahili. <laughs> there, yeah, it's, it would be a Makani Pahili Jr., right, at, 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 at the level? It actually, we should do it on the onset of hurricane season. You know, we work pr after hurricane season, we introduce what the students and the schools has uh, provided and their presentation at Makani Pahili. And then we're ready into the hurricane season. So this could be a... We can actually take that hurricane season, dissect it, what issues that we had, that's the problems that these kids solved. Okay. And we and bring that solution <laughs> at the next hurricane season. I like your activity, George. Hands flying all over the place. That's great. Uh, uh, yeah, well, about a minute before we, uh, we run out of airtime here, but let's talk about that because the timing is cool that you suggested. Makani Pahili is in May or June. School, the school semester ends in that same time period. So this could be a, a, a two-semester <laughs> two semester buildup. And actually, the, 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 the test is participation at a scholastic level in Makani Pahili. Mm -hmm. Like That's it. And I think uh, you may recall Makani Pahili about five years ago on Lanai, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, when we first met and, yep. and had this our very first discussion. So, okay, so uh, your hands waving. This is exciting stuff. Exciting to me to think of how we can bring the kids into it and also serve real missions, not just uh, robotics competitions missions. They're certainly related, but we have higher uh, uh, goals here in mind by this means. So you and I will be spending time together. We can write this up, propose it maybe here to the National Guard, and see if we can't generate, I guess what we're talking about is an academic or probably a scholastic level in Makani Pahili, played out locally on each yep. island. And Because there's more community members than there are first responders. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we just reverse the role and we, re we are creating citizen first responders to help the professionals. I like that. And at this point in time, we have taken the obligation to work this out. You and I will do that. And uh, folks, uh, this is the end of our 30-minute time period for today. So Ted Ralston here in Honolulu and George Purdy in Lanai. George, thanks for coming on again and all the bright ideas that always Thank come you, out of this. Ted. Thank you, Tim Tech. I, I, I will say that we have to limit George to three bright ideas per show. Otherwise, we can't handle them all. So George, we hit <laughs> one, 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 one over on this one. Yeah, thanks a lot, yeah. George. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. See you soon, Dan. A couple weeks. All right. A couple weeks, folks.